you see something like that on a pack? What do you what do you think? Is that a good set of claims? Did that does that look legitimate to you guys? If we look at it, the packaging material is um it looks like a cardboard, it looks like a fiber product. Uh, I didn't look at the actual packaging itself, so I can't identify what, what it was used for. But we have a few claims on there that um, are really just words on a page. For example, plastic free. Be cautious of these sorts of claims. Ultimately, it's often something you find on fiber based packaging, cardboards and things like that. Um, often they are treated with things that are not obviously plastic. So you may have a polymer coating on it and it may actually cause it to be more difficult to recycle. Uh, plastic free is a bit of a, a nebulous statement. Uh, compostable, great. Compostability, we like that. There is actually a strong re regime around certification for compostability. So when you're looking at compostability, people would, should be seeing a, a certification regime and often a serial number that will enable you to track that back to the, the source of the certification. So again, that's a good concept, but it's not really backed up by the kind of support that we need to see with it. Recycled as well, very difficult to validate. This is a tricky one because this is something that often we find suppliers will tell us, but we may not necessarily have a, any kind of substantiation on that claim. So again, we have to, uh, I think, interrogate our supply chains as much as uh, be confident in what we're telling our consumers to ensure that we know everything about where these materials are being sourced from and how they can actually make a claim like recycled. Similarly, biodegradable. Uh, biodegradable is a slightly nebulous term, but given that it is something that usually is tested in a laboratory uh, and is not often reflective of the environments in which the materials might end up. Uh, so it is a, a little bit of a fractious term at the moment, and we're seeing a lot of discussion around that in government uh, assessments of greenwash and things uh, in terms of that dialogue at the moment. Uh, so keep an eye on that one because it's uh, potentially uh, on the way out, <laughs> might I say. Um, so going back to this one, I think I probably covered that a little bit in, in the conversation earlier, so I won't go any further into that, but uh, suffice to say, uh, be, be sure that you can stand up to the sorts of claims that are being made on that packaging if you're if you're going to make those sorts of claims, because people, uh, difficult people like me might come into the mix and ask you difficult questions. <laughs> Um, we're also seeing it across other types of products as well. And it's not necessarily just uh, in terms of the packaging materials, but also in terms of the product itself. Uh, things like this, the sustainable edition title here, we're seeing sweatshop free t-shirts. Uh, these sorts of claims are very much um, moving into that uh, anti-slavery and human rights space that some of this uh, scrutiny is, is, being, is being put upon. Uh, and ultimately we also need to be able to validate with our supply chains that that is validated, that is, that is substantiated and that people can actually track back and see where those materials are coming from. So be careful with those sorts of claims in the wider context too. Another example is a great one that I was involved in in Australia actually before I left um, around something called ocean bound plastic. And again, this is quite a nebulous claim in that ocean bound plastic could really be anything <laughs> because ultimately if it gets dropped on the ground, it could be making its way to the oceans uh, through various different channels. Uh, this was pulled up with the Australian Consumer and uh, Competition Watchdog uh, and a big uh, complaint was placed by, by a number of different uh, uh, players in the marketplace, arguing that this could not be substantiated and that they were misleading consumers. And ultimately the final decision was that they had to remove that label from their packaging. And they've since moved to 100% ocean plastic, which uh, assumed that is a PET material might be a validated claim, but again, it's still not all that 100% sure because there isn't much in the uh, packaging to allow you to really check into it. So there's some of the dodgy claims that you start to see in the marketplace. And when you work in a, in a role like the one I do, we look at those with great scrutiny in our eyes and, and are very uh, uh, very concerned when we see that sort of thing. It's, it's a, a big issue in the marketplace at the moment. But there are some that we can have great faith in. And I noticed that you already have uh, some of these guys on your uh, on your agenda to talk uh, in, in the next uh, few sessions. So Fairtrade, certainly well-established, certifiable brand. They have all the, the transparency in place to be able to track claims uh, and validate you, for you as a consumer to be able to validate what it is that, that is being indicated by that, that logo. Similarly, the B Corp certification, um, an incredibly rigorous and comprehensive certification regime that looks at businesses as a whole, looks at your supply chain, looks at every aspect of the way you operate. Uh, and those businesses that have gone into those sort of certification regimes are put through pretty stringent um, testing uh, in order to be, be able to achieve them. Uh, if you're making claims on materials, for example, you can see some really good ones there around Forestry Stewardship Council stuff. Uh, we can talk about the compostable logos as well. That green uh, logo is uh, that green logo. It's a black logo on screen there, but uh, normally it's a green uh, swoosh that is, is used for compostable. Uh, and there are different regimes around the world that use that logo and will certify with, with validated numbers. <music>
Now, this is about thinking carefully about the language that you use with your customers and um, not using things which might be confusing. There was a really interesting piece of work done in the, the UK recently by the Advertising Standards Authority, which talked about um, the uh, way that consumers understand phrases like carbon neutral or net zero. Um, and perhaps, again, you won't be surprised to know that they, they don't particularly understand those. They don't understand necessarily what is meant by words like biodegradable or compostable. Um, and um, so it's really important to be clear um, what is um, what is meant by the claim so that consumers can, can look at it and, and very easily understand the wording. The next, um, the next slide I have here is about um, uh, or the next principle is about making sure that you don't hide or omit information. And this is something we see um, quite commonly. So the claim that is made is um, is true and accurate and it's um, uh, not confusing for consumers, um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And if you take, for example, um, a case where uh, there is, is um, a claim that we, you know, you've reduced transport emissions, for example, in, in your supply chain, um, but um, there has been some downside to that or where transport um, emissions only make up a tiny portion of your overall emissions and so you're focusing on a very small part and you're kind of hiding the big picture and um, that's something that you really need to avoid making sure that customers have all of the information they need to make an informed decision. I'll be quite brief on this one so making fair and meaningful comparisons we see a lot now in, in relation to um, green claims and environmental impact information businesses will often be comparing their current version of a product with previous um, so, for example, saying, you know, reduced plastic or um, less packaging um, that uh, say that any comparisons either with your own products, previous products or with other um, products out there um, from competitors, you have to be really careful to make sure that you're comparing like um, with like um, and you need to think about the way the product's being used. So um, not um, not comparing yourself with a product that's used in a very different way um, from from yours. Um, would be would be really key there. This is uh, really critical, and you'll have heard it um, coming out as I've talked about some of the other cases about the need for evidence to back up claims. Now, in the case of Truly Organics, clearly um, they were just making things up. There was no evidence that they could or should have, or that they, they could have um, had in order to back up their claim, and they didn't really um, go looking for that evidence. In the case of Mum and You, they did try to um, uh, get evidence to back up the claims that they were making, um, but managed to mismatch the claim to the evidence. Um, and, uh, and in the Arla case, the, the evidence they had, their, their um, contribution to the net zero or to the, the carbon offsetting wasn't enough to um, uh, offset the, the whole carbon. So they didn't have evidence to cover the whole of the, the claim that they were they were making. So really important to have the, have the evidence. And, and then one of the things I say most often to businesses is start with the evidence that you have um, before you decide what claims to make. Don't try and figure out how to prove something that you want to say. Think about what you can say based on the evidence that you have. So that's um, my top tip there. Um, now, this is about considering the full life cycle of a product. Now, in some jurisdictions, um, for some products, there may actually be an obligation to carry out a full life cycle analysis of the overall environmental impact of a product. Um, but it's certainly in the UK, we don't have that obligation. And, but what we do say to businesses is that you need to think about the whole life cycle of a product um, from its creation to its disposal. Um, and, and this goes back a little bit to the comment I made earlier about um, making sure that you don't um, pick on a small part of the of the, the process to, to um, base your green claim on when you leave out everything else. You really need to, to set things um, uh, overall in context. There have been some great cases in the UK recently, uh, great as in legally interesting cases in the UK recently with uh, fossil fuel companies who are marketing their renewable products, um, uh, renewable energy products, or their, their move to transition to um, electric vehicle charging in, in petrol stations and in, in gas stations um, where um, they have uh, they've been given into trouble by the Advertising Standards Authority because they haven't um, considered the, the, the overall picture. Um, obviously, those companies are spending um, far more of their money and far more of their energy on extracting fossil fuels than they are on the, the renewable side of things at the moment. So um, that, that's, a, 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 I suppose, an additional example of how you can uh, get it wrong if you don't think about the full life cycle. <laughs> If you were to say something labelled organic, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, it's really important to understand that it's a legal requirement to be certified if you want to label your food and drink product or farm as organic. So it's most definitely not a marketing gimmick, which is one of the myths that we're always working hard to bust. You'll note I specified food and drink uh, there, and that's because the same regulations do not exist in other sectors, which my colleague Paige will talk about shortly. Fundamentally, organic works with nature, not against it. 
It's a system of farming and producing food that aims to work within natural systems and cycles and strike a balance in order to maintain a sustainable system of farming and food production. You'll see the graphic on the right here is actually um, an excerpt from the, the GB regulation around organic standards. So you can see that that respect for nature and health of the soil and plants and animals is built into the regulation itself. So the way this works is that means taking a whole system approach or a closed loop approach when you try to minimize inputs and work in a balanced way. And so that means thinking about every single aspect of production to ensure the healthiest balance is struck. So for organic, this means things like when it comes to farming, planting hedgerows to encourage beneficial insects to feed on the pests so you don't have to use pesticides. It could mean planting trees to reduce soil erosion and provide shade for animals. It means integrating animals into your farming system in order to encourage soil fertility by moving manure around the farm and planting legumes that fix nitrogen and making sure animals are kept as healthily and allowed to uh, exist in as natural a space as possible, that they are truly free range and that they can be kept in a kind of a stress-free environment in order to reduce the need for antibiotics. So in organic farming, you only give an animal antibiotics if they are ill rather than as a preventative measure as in uh, non-organic systems. One big difference in both of these industries, beauty and textiles, is that organic is not a legally regulated term like it is in food. So in the beauty and well-being sphere, a product can be labelled organic if it has just 1% organic ingredients. Though over the last couple of weeks, I have heard people tell me that it can actually be 0% in order to label the product organic. Um, and it's the same in textiles. A T-shirt might say it's uh, you know made with organic cotton, but that could be a tiny amount of organic cotton with the rest of the T-shirt being made from polyester fibre. Um, so certification is extremely important in both these spaces. And I would actually say that you should not be claiming your product is organic um, if it does not have independent third party organic certification. Legally, you are allowed to. But is it really fair to mislead the consumer in that way? If your moisturizer is, for example, full of, um, you know, silicones, plastics, but it has a tiny amount of, say, organic lavender oil in, is it really fair to mislead the consumer and say that product is organic? So um, moving on to the next bit, um, this is why, like I said, certification is so important. And once you have that organic certification, you can talk about how your product protects the environment, both in the way the ingredients are grown and also the final product. What's in the final product when it goes down the drain won't be harming the environment. What I would want to advise people is to be confident. There is an awful lot of great stuff we can say about organic and we want to be really confident about saying it. There is this new phenomenon um, now coming about called green hushing, which is where brands uh, may be kind of scared nervous about what they can and cannot say in relation to green claims because of this rise of greenwashing. They don't want to be caught out or seem to be, um, you know, misleading or developing misleading claims. And so they simply don't say anything. And this is not a good thing either. We know how important it is to communicate um, the sustainability credentials of your brand. And if we stop doing it, then that just could lead to complacency. It's not helpful for customers. It's, you know, it, it really is not the right approach. And so in order to be confident, um, so draw on the tools that we have available, be confident about what we're saying, be clear about what you're saying. So um, transparency and clarity is, is a really important way to develop trust with your audience as well. And then consistency. So we might feel like we're saying the same things all the time. If I have to say 50% more wildlife uh, one more time, I, I get bored of it, but you know, um, not everyone has heard it as much as me, obviously. So it's just remembering that your audience don't have the same level of knowledge as you, and that consistency and, and repetition is really important in order to, to kind of um, get the message across. And just, we know that um, new generations growing up, you know, younger people, they're so much more in tune with um, the sustainable, you know, the sustainability world. They want, they expect um, or demand sustainability really as a, as a matter of course from the brands that they support. And we can see that they're more likely to um, purchase organic food here. This is a YouGov survey that came out last year. So. It's really positive news for us and we need to kind of nurture that and ensure that um, the claims that we are making are accurate, they're clear and they're consistent. It's important to be aware that everything you buy 
produce and use has a, has a, a carbon footprint and an environmental impact. So when we're talking about carbon, we should just never forget that basic fact. Um, you'll probably have seen uh, the term CO2e. So our footprint is measured in CO2e, which the E stands for equivalent. Um, and then communicating a carbon footprint demonstrates that your company has made accurate measurements of the impact of the product or of the organization itself. But it really is not just about the measurement. It's very important to communicate to your stakeholders what you're doing about it and basically how you're reducing it or planning to reduce it. Yeah, carbon positive, carbon neutral, green, sustainable, eco. Um, lots of lots of terms out there in the market. Um, and regulators are really cracking down on these at the minute. So um, the EU, um, the, the European Parliament, as John mentioned, is, is really cracking down on, on the use of terms like carbon neutral, especially when they're not accompanied by robust evidence. Um, and also research shows that consumers are, are confused by a lot of these terms and don't really know what to trust. So it can end up kind of diminishing the trust in, in certain products. Um, so it's best to kind of avoid terms that aren't backed by international standards um, and make sure that you get your footprint verified to back up any claims that you're making. Um, so the key takeaways, uh, remember communicate the carbon impact of products and organizations more important than ever. Consumers increasingly want to be able to, to, be able to make more informed choices. There's lots of misinformation out there. Many brands are falling afoul of regulation, sometimes deliberately, but most of the time just by accident with all good intentions. Um, having independent third party verification of carbon footprints gives customers reassurance the claims are credible and robust. You should never mark your own homework. It's a really important point. Be clear, transparent, and avoid vague or misleading language when communicating your carbon impact. Always provide evidence, don't omit important information or parts of a product life cycle. Never imply a product or organization has zero impact on the environment, or in fact, is good for the planet. And then sustainability requires collaboration. Share your challenges as well as your successes so others in your industry can learn from you. And then finally, be humble. We are decades behind, 20, 30 years behind where we need to be in terms of limiting global warming. So just acknowledge where we are on the journey. Know that, acknowledge there's still a lot of work to be done and be humble and take your consumers along with you and you'll find that they'll probably be, that they'll reward you with the fact that you're not sort of overstating what you're doing. One of the terms that is thrown around a lot um, when it comes to philanthropy is intersectionality. Um, and what we think about is the intersectionality or connectiveness of these different impact areas. So this Venn diagram um, shows four impact areas that we've defined. So reforestation, poverty, community development, and gender rights. All of these issues are independent, but are connected and intertwined. Um, this highlights the importance of why your business should be thinking about what specific impact areas matter to your business and your stakeholders the most, and identifying what partners might fit into that sweet spot. And that's what we do with our business members here at 1% for the Planet to help them identify their partners. But it's a really important exercise for your business when you're thinking about smart environmental giving. Just note the, the power of having value come from uh, your business. It's not just the product anymore. Um, in a recent study, they found that companies that are purpose-driven do grow three times faster than their competitors. They show higher levels of innovation and uh, they show higher levels of workforce retention, which is all super important and ladders up to the success of a business. Um, in another recent study, they found that companies that lead with their purpose and communicate their purpose, um, they found that respondents were 78% more likely to want to work for that company, 72% more likely to be loyal to that company, 76% uh, more likely to trust that company, and 66% of respondents found that they do consider purpose when they make purchasing decisions. But credibility is huge today in uh, marketing. 93% of Gen Z say that if a company makes a commitment, it should have the appropriate programs to back up that policy. 82% of consumers said that they took action to support a company when they believe in that purpose. Uh, I noted before that the power of purpose lies within activation and a marketer's dream, of course, is that your uh, purpose and your the, the stuff you're putting out into the world is causing people to take action. So 82% of consumers said that they took actions such as spreading the word about a company, encouraging others to support the brand, becoming a brand advocate, and starting to buy uh, from that brand, which of course is the number one win. Farmers and agricultural workers have a host of social and economic and environmental challenges. I'm not gonna read these all out to you, um, but what I wanted to convey is that 
that they are on the front lines of the climate crisis. They're feeling the effects of the rising temperatures today. The change in climate and extreme weather patterns, it's threatening their livelihoods. And at the same time, farmers have a critical role to play in addressing climate change, and they have the expertise as well as localized knowledge to do so. But they often simply can't afford to foot the bill for adapting to the economic and climate pressures on their current incomes. And when we think about it, a typical rural agricultural household is living underneath the poverty line. And what I want to convey again is that low incomes leads to difficult choices for farmers and workers and their communities. So I'm painting a pretty bleak picture here. Um, why? Um, well, basically today, we are going to be talking about fair trade. And we'll talk about fair trade certification as a critical step towards more sustainable productions and fair prices. We are a holistic, we have holistic standards for people, planet and prosperity. We have, we've set it a strong trust and recognition in the fair trade mark. Um, we are, we partner with, with, with um, businesses, producers on sustainable sourcing, and we are partners with producers. Um, as Hannah mentioned, it's a horizontal relationship that is looking to add value for producers. Um, we're working towards increasing incomes, towards living incomes and living wages. And in doing all of this, we're, we're working to amplify producer voice. Um, and it's, producers are, are represented in all the decision ma making across fair trade. So it's key that we're highlighting their needs, challenges and successes and everything that we do. So if we want to dig in a little, little bit more detail as well, then we we also find that 80%, 81% of, of consumers care about independent third party certification. 77% uh, say the fair trade label makes it easy to decide if a product is ethically and responsibly produced. And 67% agree with the statement that they're willing to pay to pay slightly more for a to ensure that the producers receive a fair price 